Yes, uh, you, you're actually very lucky that I'm not playing music for you, because I think I'm a better speaker than I was a musician. Uh, this unfortunately cannot be evidence, because I was uh, busy before the internet, before every single thing was recorded and being made available worldwide on YouTube and other places like this. So, um, I want to kick off and say, you know, when I read the report and the previews of the report, when I saw the presentation, uh, it really surprised me that one word kept coming back, and that word is stagnation. Right? It seems like not much is going to happen. <laughs> and I can't tell you how much of the opposite of that is that what I experience when I work with people, it, it's like an express train. It's like, uh, it's like a rocket blasting off. It's not stagnation. It's... it's opportunities that are coming up right now that we've been discussing for 10 years, but they're finally here. You know, the Internet of Things, what's called the Internet everywhere, machine-to-machine -machine communications, mobility, what's called big data, right? the reinvention of money, digital money. I mean, all these things, if you string them all together, you can say that it's, it's extremely exciting times right now for the new things, you know, granted, of course, the the uh, incumbents are sometimes up for a tough battle, like newspapers, publishers. Anybody remember record labels? Yes, uh, there were also still record labels. Uh, but, so the question is, you know, I want to ask first, um, what does the future is do? And so in the bottom line, you know, I, I kind of look into the next three to five years, I try to touch the future this way, and I work backwards with my clients. So we don't sit here and we say, how can we extrapolate from what we do today? We try to travel five years from now and say, what is pretty certain going to happen five years from now? Give you a simple example. When I worked in the music business, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to meet a lot of great musicians and uh, music industry people, uh, and I was in San Francisco in 1999 with Napster. Do you remember Napster? You know, the downloading software. Um, so when it all got started, so when it got started, basically it was clear then, this was 1999, it was clear what people want is to have the jukebox in the sky. You know, a place where you go to, you click a button and the music plays. That was clear 1999. Was not rocket science, it didn't have to be a futurist. So what was the re response of the music industry is to say, well, I, we don't appreciate this idea because it, it doesn't really jive with our idea of selling boxes, you know, units. And, and uh, 50,000 lawsuits later and uh, 50 initiatives like SOPA and Hadopa and Hadopi and all these things later, what do we have? 74% decline of recorded music. And what do we have now? Music in the sky, right? Spotify, SimFi, finally have it. So it's not that hard to actually see into the future. And uh, part of my job is what I call pattern recognition. All of you do this every day, but it's hard to do when you're actually operating companies is to also think about the patterns of the future. And the companies I work with sort of take those patterns and try to work that into business model. And, and I think this is something that is uh, really happening in all companies now. If you want to download my free books and all my other stuff, you can go to my website or uh, follow me on Twitter if you are tweeting, which I certainly hope you are, so you can hang on to the future. So here's the key question I have for you. It is a confusing world today. I mean, think about all this. I mean, if you're, if you're in a, a business position, for example, of a newspaper publishing, you know that you can't really force people to pay. At the same time, advertisers don't come to you and throw money for, you at your, for your website. Right? So the signs are pointing in all different directions. And the question that I had when I was looking and preparing this, what is the new road map for Luxembourg and for the businesses in Luxembourg? And is it going to be smooth sailing for money? Unfortunately, I couldn't find any euros there. I could only find dollars. Uh, or is it going to explode? Are we going to have a, a money ball explosion? And the funny part is, you know, I, I live in Switzerland, and there are so many parallels between Switzerland and Luxembourg in many which ways. And I just became a Swiss citizen. Uh, I'm a German citizen originally. And so I feel sort of compelled to look at what's happening in Switzerland, Luxembourg, was a very good study. I'll go more into this later, but the question is also, will we actually not just talk, think about money, but will we be happy in the future? What is the gross national happiness index, you know, as the state of Bhutan says? And what, what does that have to do with money? And how do we measure success? How do we measure GDP? 
China has 9.6% growth of GDP. Are they more happy? Are they more successful? So those are questions. And I, I ran across this website and uh, John Le then uh, that was sent to me. And this idea about what's happening in Luxembourg and you know, why Luxembourg is good for business. And when I was reading this website, I couldn't help think back to a guy uh, named Arthur C. Clarke, a science fiction writer from the 40s. And uh, he has a very good comment on this website from 2013. Here's his comment. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So, if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable, have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. That's my message to you. I'm not going to be giving you any recipes today, so I have to uh, disappoint you for this. I want to be unreasonable, and I would like you to be unreasonable, because I think the only way to create the future is to be unreasonable. And this is so true from the 40s. Right? And when you talk to Jeff Bezos, you're talking about Jeff Bezos earlier, that's what he did, right? He was unreasonable. Steve Jobs was unreasonable, and the Google guys are definitely unreasonable, <laughs> in a positive way, I hope. Right? But I mean, if you look what Jeff Bezos did at Amazon, he came up with the Kindle. Nobody has asked him for the Kindle. And when he took the Kindle to the publishers, the publisher said, we don't really like this idea. We want to print books and ship the books. And so what, he did, what did he do? He bought the books for the regular book price. He made them electronic and he paid the publisher 30% of the price to sell it cheaper to the customers. So he subsidized to the tune of $8 billion so that we get to use the Kindle. And now today, guess what? More people are reading books on the Kindle than in print. So that's what it takes is to be unreasonable. And I think this is a very tough lesson for us Central Europeans. You know, of course, in Switzerland, we're never unreasonable. You know, we're, we're always diplomatic and safe and secure and uh, independent. Huh? But unreasonably, I mean, if you think about unreasonable, you think about two people, right? The Chinese, maybe, and the Americans. Because if you're thinking about basically what's happening in terms of mindset. We have to develop that mindset here. This, is, I think, is crucial. We can't be complacent because the speed is just mind-boggling. Exponential technological leaps. I'm not a tech guy. You know, I'm a, originally a music guy, so I'm not a techno-maniac. Right? But technology is mind-boggling if you see the changes that we're already experiencing every single day. The other day, I went to my doctor. And I had Googled my problem before, and I said, look, I found this. What do you think about that? And he said, you know what? I don't care what you have Googled. I am the doctor. And I said, why? Well, that, that's not the response I was hoping to hear from my doctor. But exponential technological leaps. Here's an example. Five years from now, you will be able to touch through your phone. Computers will be able to not only look at images, but understand them. Computers will hear what matters. The computer system will know what I like to eat better than I do. Computers will have a sense of smell. Today, my ambulance knew all about a bike accident just by talking to a helmet. It grabbed the patient's record before we even picked him up. It found out the doctor we needed was at St. Anne's. And it got his okay on treatment from miles away. It even pulled strings with the stoplights. My ambulance talks with smoke alarms and pilots and stadiums. But of course, it's a good listener too. That's a Cisco video. There's a reason for this, right? But if technology can solve all these issues, and if, if we can get connected with the Internet of Things, if my health records are in the sky when I have an accident in Chile, I can be immediately connected to the data. Those are technological leaps that are absolutely mind-boggling. Big data, ubiquitous connectivity, real-time so-called social media, cheap devices at the Internet of Things. This is a graph from from Ericsson, how that is uh, taken off what they call the third wave of networked everything. Ericsson is predicting 50 billion devices connected to the internet. And I'm not talking about toasters and, and refrigerators. Right? I'm talking about sensor networks in the, in the traffic lights, in my car, right? in my asthma machine that I may have to use to measure and connect with others. Mind-boggling possibilities, a smart, a smart world that is going to save 40% of CO2 emissions could be saved, could be, could be put back by having technology make it more efficient, 40%. So if we, if we made a switch to renewable energy and did this, right, we'd be home free, I mean, in, in theory at least. Intelligent systems for a connected world, I mean, exponentiality, according to Ray Kurzweil, a, 
another famous futurist that you may know, the founder of a singularity movement. This is the issue with exponentiality. Yeah, humans aren't exponential. So if I work 16-hour days, I'm not going to be you know, at twice as productive when I work 8-hour days. You know, that's not the way it works with us, because we're not machines yet. So what I'm contemplating is uh, when I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's quite clear. But when I count 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, that's exponential. And I tell you right now that we are at 4. And the next number isn't 5, it's 8. And this is the reason why we can't afford to sit here and say, let's take a Swiss <coughs> wait and see attitude. It's not going to work. Because by the time I've seen it, I'm toast. I'm already run over by the exponential future. I mean, looking at these devices, right, it's all that stuff is now on an iPhone. Right? And the blind spot that we have, because we can't think exponentially, is very, very dangerous. And this is a cultural thing, of course. Well, what we have to do is we have to start thinking exponentiality uh, into our business model. For example, here are some key trends from 2020. Global population growth, everybody knows, but 65% of people will be connected to the Internet in 2020. That's almost 5 billion people. And who are they? Well, we already are connected, right? They're the Russians and the Indians and the Indonesians and the Chinese and so on. They will change dramatically what we do because it's all interconnected. How we pay, who we pay, wh where we get information from, and do you think that your business model from today is going to be the same in 2020 with 5 billion people connected? I mean, clearly with Google Glass and the rise of data and the self-driving car that Google is coming up with that's based on data, 3D printing, where you can print your shoes, iPhone covers, and of course you can print a printer as well. Uh, and, and here is a device that allows you to connect your home heating system and your air condition to the iPhone called the Nest. Using such a device would result in over 40% energy savings in homes. It's already been investigated and 5 million people are using this. Augmented reality, uh, shopping with, with uh, virtual reality to where you can tweet or Facebook the dress and get responses from your friends in real time. This is something you would do every single day, I'm sure. Augmented reality shopping, I mean, mind-boggling the stuff that we're seeing here. In three years, we will not be using translation things anymore. We will have automated, real-time, spoken and written translation into 25 languages. Not finished to, to uh, Chinese, for example. That's kind of difficult. Huh? But I mean, this is already working. The other day I was in the Google Labs and I spoke in, into a mobile device in German and it came out in Chinese in real time. Imagine how that will change your business in 2020. So um, Mary Meeker, who is the lead investor in Facebook, sorry to say, but um, she publishes a slide every year. It's called the Internet Trends and you can download it from the uh, Clyde Perkins website. But she talks about the reimagination of everything. And this is so true. If you're looking at, you know, most of you have kids, I assume. If you're looking at your kids and how they consume television, they don't even know what it means to sit down at quarter after eight for tart order or something, you know. They would never understand. I mean, they have reimagined how this works. They have reimagined education. They learn on YouTube. They go, I mean, it's mind-boggling how all these things are changing. And Einstein has said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, imagination and circles the world. So what we have to think about is so how can we imagine what we do a couple of years into the future? And this is really sort of our roadmap, the roadmap, the reimagination of everything. And of course, part of that is unfortunately taking a leap. Trying something you haven't done before. And again, this is something that is very difficult for us here in Europe. I lived in America for 14 years where leaping is part of the daily sport. And if you haven't gone bankrupt once, you haven't lived. So this is a different cultural thing, but look at what happened, for example. Apple made 50% of the money with the iPhone that wasn't here five years or six years ago. The Kindle is now generating huge amounts of profits. That wasn't here five years ago. LinkedIn, that we all scuffed at years ago and saying, what do we need this for? Making $800 million now, having invented the market, essentially. And GigaOM says over 70% of Apple's revenue and almost 50% of IBM's comes from things that weren't here a few years ago. So 
I would propose to you a majority of your 2018 revenues may well result from products and services that don't exist today. And that's pretty safe to say. Okay. So what does that mean? It means if we don't start creating things that will be there now, half of your revenue will be gone. That's what it means. And I can tell you this is quite obvious in many instances, you know, in the publishing business or the media business. It was obvious. Okay. But we don't, sometimes we don't like reality, so we prefer to hide. But this is a difficult thing to do, you know, when your business is sort of going okay, is to contemplate that it may not and make those changes. So here's some bottom lines to start with. One, the future cannot be extrapolated by looking forwards from today. In other words, what works today is very likely not to work tomorrow because of the extreme exponential change. The other thing is that we have to get used to business as usual is not coming back ever, anywhere. What worked then is not coming back. We don't have to keep looking for it. Okay. The growth that we've known is not coming back because we have saturated, because we have used what was there. Right? We have done this. Traditional advantages may become obstacles. If you are successful today, that is an obstacle. Because, you know, if you're not suffering, why would you, you know, why would you reinvent? If you're not uh, troubling with your wife, why would you get divorced? You know, it's the same thing. You know? So it's either pain or love. You have to do something. You know? So if you're looking at what happened with a lot of the big innovation of the past, Steve Jobs fell in love with the idea of, of a touch screen. Right? And when I worked with Nokia, they said to me, you know what? Nobody wants touch screens. Yeah, sure. Well, look where they are now. So that, you know, falling in love with an idea is crucial. Huge opportunities generated by technology and the resulting habit shifts. And this is, no, this is uh, certainly true in the financial markets. The habit shifts. Right? Well, that's not really a shift, but it's pronounced now. There's a deep trust crisis with financial institutions. Um, that's a fact. And the habit shift is to not trust them to begin with. Right. So how can you actually work with this, with technology, to actually help this? So when I was looking at the slides, I couldn't help kind of have a laugh about this. Uh, when it says that the decision makers said, OK, a majority assumes that social media is somewhat interesting. But right now, social media has a minor impact, right? 53%. I want to ask, where have you been? Until now, if you, if you think that social media has a minor impact, talk to your kids. They prefer to watch Al Jazeera on Facebook than to switch on the TV. They exchange information all day long on all different platforms. I mean, social media is something where we can say, you know, if you have the Swiss attitude and maybe also local attitude to some degree, as I can see from these slides, right? Uh, wait and see. Wait and see really means please forget about me. Wait and die. Same thing. So that's, that's really the consequence. And I can't tell you how many clients I've seen seven years ago that said, yeah, this all sounds good and we should do that, but, you know, we don't take risks here. And they're dead. They're dead. I mean, not because of my bad advice, but, or good advice for that matter, but, you know. So let's take a look at the traditional business advantages. And these are all good advantages, and they're very much Swiss and Luxembourg combined in a, in a, in a nutshell. Right? Advantages on location, geography, people, demographics, working ethic, and so on, based on legislation, regulation. No, we have pretty much the same background here. Advantages based on access to information and what are called data exclusivity. Having access to something that somebody does not. So data, information, scarcity of resources, money, for example, as a resource. Those were good traditional business advantages. And, and you have exported those here in Luxembourg to a very nice degree, and I congratulate you for that. But that's a burning platform. Right? Because these advantages are still here, but now there's new advantages being desired, and they look like this, right? They look, they're part of the networked society, of the network effect that goes on on a global level now, and they include things like this creating new ecosystems, creating things, business models that work together and across boundaries. And this is all for the European thought, of course, but it's not so easy to create an ecosystem when it's incomplete. 
Again, going back to publishing, biggest problem is ecosystem isn't complete. It's not that people don't want to pay, it's not that advertisers don't want to advertise, but it's not put together yet. Uh, there's, there's, there's gaps there. So when you're living in this gap, it's a nightmare. You know? So you, you have to create ecosystems and you have to become indispensable. The car companies today, Audi, BMW, Volvo, what is their first initiative now? It's no longer the fancy sport car for the likes of you and me. What is it? It's a self-driving car. Self-driving car? Why would I buy a self-driving car? You know, if, if you like cars, it's useless. Right? But Google came up with a self-driving car. And everybody was thinking, what is, why is Google doing this? Well, the reason Google is doing this because when I'm in the self-driving car, I'm going to use Google. The rising tide floats all boats. Google becomes indispensable. Now, I would submit to you if Luxembourg as a financial, a place for financial organizations and funds and so on, if it doesn't become indispensable by added value, it will be depends, dispensed with. That, that is just, that's the option. You're either indispensable or somebody will dispense you. That's what happened to all of the large organizations. So, in the being indispensable is crucial. Focus on speed, offensive innovation. Offenses meaning changing something that is painful but has a better result. And the strategy based on abundance. There is no shortage of money. There is no shortage of money. It's abundant, but where does it go? I mean, how do we get? How do we have a strategy that merits it? Why, why is the money all moving south and east now? Because of GDP growth? I'm not sure. And then we still have the old values. They're here, they're, they're also really powerful values as well. They're not gone. So, bottom line is, and I can safely say this about Switzerland, I won't go as far as saying this about Luxembourg. I don't know enough about Luxembourg. I've been here a few times, but if you live in a dome of protection, you know, in, in a bubble, in a protected space. You're lucky, because people have to pay to get in. And you can control the dome. And this is what happened to a lot of financial institutions, for banks, for record labels, for publishers, for satellite companies. They built a dome, it was expensive, and to, to get in you have to pay. And they even privately lived in their small little domes surrounding their heads, you know, their mindsets. And some of that still works, but the future really is about this, right? The future is about interconnecting business models, right? about being part of a setup of wheels. Let me ask you a question. Now, considering our natural inclination of humans to control the wheel or to be the wheel, you know, Apple type, be the wheel, right? this doesn't feel very safe to us because, you know, the other wheels are also moving and, and, and we have to somewhat keep a steady view on this. We can't control the wheel. But what is the likelihood that you can be the only wheel? That likelihood was pretty big 20 years ago. You know, likes of Microsoft and others, they, they were the wheel. That was it. But now Skype, you know, from this country, more or less launched. Skype is the best example. There wouldn't be any Skype if the other users weren't online providing the bandwidth for Skype. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. So the future is about this, right? It's about creating and being an important player in this ecosystem. And of course, there will be you know, the redefinition of growth along the way. If you're looking at growth as just GDP, I think you're missing the boat. You know, if we're all just chasing profit and growth in one direction, we'll eventually explode. I mean, if you know, see what's happening here, the numbers are quite clear. You know, China, India, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Tanzania have the biggest growth in GDP. Well, it's obvious reasons why that is. We have to redefine it. And the chief of um, HSBC said the new reality is in The Guardian, I am afraid a world of significantly lower growth, stagnation, right, where the gap between our expectations and actual income is getting bigger day by day. How do we redefine growth? I mean, what do we actually do with growth? So here's a roadmap for this. Right? When looking at this, this is traditional thinking about growth. You know, roadmaps, plans, targets, return on investment, campaigns. You know, military terms, linearity, stationarity, projections, and so on. A good MBA battle map. Okay. 
But this is where it's going now. All of a sudden, we're saying, no, oh, this is about networks, connecting with other businesses, creating networks, creating interfaces, APIs, flows, return on engagement, resilience, agility, speed. I mean, if you're not 15, you'd be scared. Because you know, these are all skills that we have said, and we, we don't really need this uh, in the same way. Agility and resilience, we want to be powerful. We don't want to be resilient. But I think this is where our future is going, is we're going to be more like a scaffold, the strongest building material in Asia, by the way, bamboo. We're going to be more like a scaffold than a road to the money. Because in this scaffold, if something breaks, we'll just put something else in. It's resilient. It's collaborative. It works together. It can grow in any, any which direction. And this is the reason, of course, why it's widely used for building. So our economic model has to be more like this. It's not such a clear roadmap like this where say, follow the money. I doubt it. So basically, I think we're heading in this direction. And when I was looking at the slides, and I got this from the, I think from the Ward uh, newspaper, um, talking about the Wettbewerbsfähigkeit, the competit competitiveness, I, I couldn't help thinking, it's like, why does it matter? Why does it matter? I think it's going to be more about Kollaborationsfähigkeit, the ability to collaborate to create new business opportunities, rather than the ability to, to compete each other for the same slice of pie is make, this, make the pie bigger. Of course, that's a very American viewpoint, uh, clearly. But to be hyper-collaborative, uh, yeah? and I think it was Bill Gates who said, it's not about hyper-competition, it's about hyper-collaboration. Our future forward is not about hyper-competition, it's about hyper-collaboration. Because the, the changes in our world are so huge, if we don't collaborate, we won't be part of them and they can't be seized by just one entity. Take this opportunity. It's a, it's a $3.4 trillion opportunity to rewrite transportation. Cars, trains, airlines, it's huge. This opportunity will not be created by one company or by Tesla or by, you know, by whoever. It, this is a collective issue that will require lots of different laws and so on. So, for example, if I have a car like this and I go for 200 kilometers, I'm, I'm over, right? Because there's no, there's no electric gas station. <laughs> the, e the ecosystem doesn't exist. So I think what, uh, we're right now at this point to where we can say, you know, if we can build a, a system to where we can complete those ecosystems, that's a huge opportunity. That goes for, for legal, for banking, for medical, for renewable energy. The opportunity is to co-create a new ecosystem, not shore up the old one. I think that is where we're going. I'll give you a short video to give you my mindset as, as far as uh, how we're going to get there. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. To your call. So, yeah, so that, that teaches us something, right? What are we assuming? about the future, about what we do, that actually isn't so. I mean, you, you would not believe the amount of conversations I have with CEOs about their beliefs, those are truly beliefs, they're orthodoxies, right, assumptions, that govern how the whole company is work, working, but those assumptions are never questioned. And what are our assumptions about where it's going? I think this is a key question. You know, what do we think? What's our mindset? You know, which way are we going with this? I want to ask you about this. Okay, first here's the fortune cookie. Blessed are the children, for they shall inherit the national debt. And here's Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> you never change things by fighting the existing model, some reality, to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. 
So what is your viewpoint? They're going to build a new model to fight the existing model to make it obsolete. It sounds like a good paradigm, you know, California paradigm. Yeah. Which way are you taking with this? I, I think when I look at this at the presentation earlier, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, stagnation, you know, we're going to basically give our children the debt. Right. That won't work. It's already a lot there. I mean, this goes for every single part of this. For example, if you're looking at the New York Times and the paywall, okay, the concept that people will pay $300 a year to read the New York Times online because the New York Times can't figure out how to make it work other which way right, was marginally successful. But think about this for a second. Right? This actually goes back to the belief issue. The belief was our journalism is worth money. Nothing wrong with that belief. I love the New York Times. I love their writers. I love their content. Nothing wrong with that. Second belief was if it's worth the money, you should pay up. Not a good idea, right? because in general, people have never done that. Uh, it's supported by advertising. That's not a secret. I mean, in the US, you can buy the entire subscription to the New York Times. Uh, correct me on this, I think it's $29 a year subsidized to other things, or $10 a year for Time magazine, because it's subsidized by advertising. Well, I'm not, I've never paid for time over New York Times, in, in reality. So what we have now, the BBC guy took over, Mark Thompson took over the New York Times, uh, and they're realizing that if they go on like this, it's not bad, it's not going to solve the problem. This is the most reputable newspaper in the world, really, and allegedly the best writers. $300 a year, guess how many subscribers they have. Uh, this is a a chart showing the growth. Right now, I think they have roughly 1.3 million subscribers. That's not bad. You know, it's $300 million, something like that. Huh? But are they going to get to 50? Nope. Are they going to increase costs, decrease costs? Nope. Are they going to lose the advertisers? Yes. So really what we need to see, how, how do beliefs shape businesses? I think it's about pay will, not pay wall. That's, that's the secret. People aren't cheap, people aren't bad, people aren't pirates, people aren't cheaters. They pay for value. And where do they pay? The Economist, The Atlantic, LinkedIn Pro, Farmville, Netflix, Spotify. I mean, people are paying for content. So let's figure out a model. And how do we do this? The movie industry has been famous for the scene on the left, which is to hide the content at all costs or sell it to the likes of us who will pay seven euros to watch it for 24 hours. And I do that, so I'm not complaining. But look at what Netflix has done. Netflix, you know, the online service for $10 a month, unlimited streaming, 40 million users paying $10. No questions asked. Well, right now, it's not available in most countries in Europe for licensing issues, right? But, I mean, look at this. I mean, pay will, pay wall, right? Netflix has achieved the goal of pay will. All of those movies I can download somewhere else, if I set my mind to it. So the lesson is the future is not a zero-sum game. It's not you win, I lose, or you lose and I win. It's not that game any longer. The future is a game to where we can have several wins. It's possible because of the technology changes that make things abundant. When things are abundant, you don't have to kill somebody to get their food. There's enough food for everyone. Scarcity-based models are ending. If your company is based on scarcity, some sort of, you know, God forbid, even artificial scarcity, you're in deep trouble. Because you know, people are finding out now that this is really not scarce, you're just making it scarce, like music. For example, here, lending online is exploding. Financial advice on the web exploding. How are you going to be scarce? How is information about money going to be scarce? It isn't. As um, Peter Diamante said, who is also a colleague of Kurzweil, he wrote a great book called Abundance that you should read. And he's basically saying uh, abundance is replacing scarcity as the key operating paradigm. We have to base our future business model on abundance. Abundance of information, abundance of users, Right? Abundance of, of marketing, abundance of media, and abundance of money. 
That sounds kind of strange when you're thinking about the current you know, financial situation that we're in. But basically, when everything moves into the cloud, everything is there. My health records, my movies, my media files, my, uh, uh, my data, everything is there. And abundance has all these things that are completely the opposite of scarcity. So this is a concept, I think, we should investigate. The other thing that goes with this, and this is not just true for media, is that we're going in a, in a, on a global scale from ownership to access. Uh, first, true for music, of course. You know, nobody owns music anymore. We just click on it in a place. Nobody owns movies anymore, right? You don't collect those weird boxes with the tape inside. You, know? you just click. Now, a lot of kids in America, and this is a global trend, don't get a driver's license. Guess why? They don't want to own a car. They want to drive somewhere, they take public transportation, or they're being driven, or they're going to use a self-driving car. Or they don't need a license. The trend is clear. We're going from this idea of the proud ownership of cars, the proud ownerships of books, the proud ownerships of houses and rental houses and airplanes, to a sharing and lending model. And this is a good trend, because there's an entirely new business unfolding. Our Avis just bought Zipcar, for example, for that very same reason, from ownership to access. And to go back to news one more time, because there's a lesson to there, the newspaper companies have learned something, and that is that what they're actually selling isn't the content. The content is the reason, of course, the, the reason to be, and this has to be good content, and it's, it's the core of things. But the selling of it, the money, comes in through added values, like this chart from my colleague Ross Dawson shows. Right? All the added values that you can add to the deal that seal the deal. For example, here you can see interfaces, community, filtering, relevance, aggregation, timeliness. I mean, if it wasn't for, for Twitter, nobody would be watching CNN anymore. Because that's how Twitter gets to be timely. Right? How CNN gets to be timely. So, back to The Economist, I mentioned it earlier. I subscribe to The Economist, and I love their writers, but I would never want to have the, the, the printed Economist, because I usually don't have it when I want to read it. It's somewhere in my living room, right? And it's, I consider that wasteful, basically. So the reason I pay a hundred bucks or so for The Economist is because when I'm in the car, I can't read, I can listen to The Economist as an MP3, an audio. And I'm paying for the ability to listen as an audio. That's what I pay for. I love the writers. I would never pay for the MP3 if the writers were bad, clearly. But the reverse is also true. I would never pay for The Economist if it wasn't for the audio. Okay. And that is the future of many of our businesses. The future is that we have to add value. We have to add value in a hundred different ways. If you're a publisher, if you're, uh, if you're a power company, if you're a utility company, if you're a satellite company, you have to add value continuously because they become the new core, adding values around the core. And uh, you can download the slides later, by the way, but Kevin Kelly calls these things the new generatives, the new reason to buy. And I can tell you one thing, if you don't get reason to buy from your clients, there's nothing you can do. You can't force them to buy. You can't force them to come to you and say, yes, we're going to stay with you just because X, Y, Z. They have to have a reason. And we have to generate those reasons. And those reasons are always changing. So the other thing is that I think we have to face, and this is a real European issue. Right? We're now interdependent. What we do in Switzerland can't just be put behind the Alps and forgotten. Right? I mean, Basically, we're now in a place where it's completely intertwined. All of our fates are intertwined. The fates of terrorism, the, the fates of, of energy. I mean, in Switzerland, we want to get rid of nuclear power, but in France, they have 50 stations right across the border. You know, what good is that going to do to us? So it's all interdependent. Our economic models are completely intertwined, so it makes no sense for us to try to take them apart and become independent again. There is no such future. It won't work. Right. Interdependence, in my view, is the new default. And uh, if I uh, look at the coverage, you now basically I think the future of Europe is interdependence, based on some independence, of course, you know, in, in certain matters. But if you're looking at this, I think it's basically quite clear that we're heading in this direction. Uh, I'll give you some examples. This is taken, by the way, from a great movie called Connected by Tiffany Schlein that you should watch. This scene with the trees is taken from that movie. So very much like this, basically, I think lateral growth, you know, education. 
I mean, we're looking at a three trillion dollar shift of education to go online. Textbooks, e-textbooks, subscriptions, video classes, remote learning, digital learning, lifelong learning, online training. Right? We're not, we're not going to be successful with this unless we do it interdependently, because there's many issues to be solved. Advertising, the future of money. It is very likely that in 10 years we won't have credit cards. Why is that likely? Because you know, we, we can just carry the same numbers with us on our mobile phone. The only thing that stands between that is privacy. And we can solve that. So I mean, basically, all these things are pointed in one direction. You know, if you're looking at all this stuff, uh, emissions, as I said earlier, we can reduce CO2, CO2 dramatically by collaborating on technology solutions. It doesn't mean we don't need to make that switch. Uh, this would be an addition. Interdependent lateral growth, I think, is the only future. My question I have for you is Luxembourg in a unique position to shape this future. I think it is, much like Switzerland, interesting. Except the Swiss won't do it. So the question, I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing my part to get them to that point, but uh, I think being in a unique position to build an interdependent ecosystem, that's what we're looking at. I mean, this is the future of money, it's the future of medical, it's the future of media, it's the future of what we're looking at. And the question I have in that context, market maker, market taker, market waiter. And we have Americans who clearly know they're cowboys, right? They're market makers. Brazilians, right? they're the new Americans. Market takers, we know who they are. <laughs> they can take anything, mostly without paying, but anyway. Uh, and here we are in Switzerland, the market waiters. Okay. I think being a market waker is a, is a recipe for disaster. Because as things speed up and everybody's gearing up to, to uh, being a market maker, sorry, uh, everybody's gearing up to be a maker, and then we have a big issue. So, so what is Luxembourg? Uh, can you move this over in this one direction a little bit? And this is essential. This is not an option. Right? It is not an option to be a waiter. When the speed is exponential and everybody's gunning for the same direction and we have growth that's lateral, how can you be a waiter? You look like a, a run over armadillo by the side of the road later. I mean, look at, look at these slides. Most major Luxembourg companies are not especially concerned about alternative online business models. Right, let's go back and say, most major record labels are not uh, especially concerned about the internet. They'll just sue everyone. And so we'll solve the problem. I mean, nobody will be safe from these disruptions of these new business models that are happening. Nobody. We think that we're safe because you know, we have existing clients, we have trust relationships, it's a people business, and so on and so on. But the reality is, if you look at LinkedIn as an example, LinkedIn has killed the entire human resources and headhunting business in one stroke. All of the hiring is done now through LinkedIn. And I mean, how, is, how has that changed everything that we do here? Technology user empowerment will disrupt more and more cash cows because those cows are ready to be slaughtered. I mean, they've been a long time. Take a look at this slide for telecoms. Anybody from the telecom business here? Uh, telecom, I think, currently makes about $370 million a day in SMS. Well, guess what? When people have a data contract, they stop using SMS because they can use WhatsApp and Viber to make free phone calls. And they could do all the other things like Twitter and Facebook. They stop using SMS. That's what we see here. Right? Over the top, OTT, service platforms are replacing SMS. The $370 million cash cow per day is about to go to the butcher. This is happening everywhere. It's happening with doctors, with banks, with insurance companies. But we have to think about how we react, and I think the end of protected spaces is near. If, if you're looking to go back into that dome, good luck. It's already cracking all over the place. I mean, the consumerization of technology, people are expecting everything. They're comparing us, they're rating doctors, they're, they're rating hotels, and they're, they're, they're on Airbnb, they're renting to each other. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare, right? I mean, for an organized business, it's a nightmare. So the end of those protected spaces is here, and this is the next on the list. 
clear, you know, media is already in the cracked dome, or the dome is already evaporated. Next is telecom, banking, money, medical, and pharma. And the pharma companies are looking at this and saying, oh, this is actually not so bad because we can find people who can help us solve complex uh, problems, chemical problems that are not working for us, and we cut them in on new medications for rare diseases, for example. They're already doing this. They're crowdsourcing those new formulas. They're already doing this. So we're heading into a direction to where pervasive mobile connectivity will radically reshape everything that we do. How we travel, how we vote, how we find information, how we report things. And this is, I call this the uh, tyranny of transparency. I mean, as a business, you're naked now. You're, you're essentially naked. Because somebody can always report on you and, and uh, change something. Everything becomes ICT. Lucky for Luxembourg. Everything becomes technology or content, one of the two. A doctor is going to have the power of the Watson IBM computer at his disposal anywhere in the world in the next five years. And the Watson computer can tell him, for this kind of cancer that you're looking at, I've got 247,000 cases, and it's very likely that this is an answer. It's not going to replace the doctor. But financial services, you know, you can push a button and say, give me, a, give me an, an estimation, anticipation of when I should buy this fund or not, and the computer will be 99.9% .9 right. That's already happening. I mean, you, you work on this every single day. So a key point here is that data is truly the new oil. And I mean this quite literally. And if, this is not from me. This is already born in 2006, this paradigm by, I think, the American Marketing Association, because everything that we do now is about data. Where we are, what we like, you know, every, every bank or every financial institution in the world wants to be liked on Facebook. Now think of the irony there. But data is truly the new oil. I mean, everything we do creates, generates data. And when our cars are connected and our everything, you know, and our plans and our toaster and our refrigerator. So maybe Luxembourg could be the next UAE. Maybe Luxembourg can be the place for where that data is being distilled and refined and stored and treated safely. There's a couple of states looking for this position. Right? But this, I mean, just this alone will put the word stagnation into the back for the next 20 years. And it's up for grabs. You need a lot of know-how for this. This is not trivial. Right? Big data, big intelligence, big opportunities. One of those is the fortune cookie. No, it's prediction predictive markets. There are already people buying stock based on Twitter predictions called tweet stock. You can check it out. But basically what's happening is here is when we have data, we can predict things. Google is already doing this, and we can use this for lots and lots of reasons. And I think that what's happening with big data is that unlike oil, it doesn't pollute. It cannot be owned by a bunch of companies because the, the data is interactive and fluid, it has to be permitted to use the data, so it cannot be owned like oil. This is a very, very powerful business scenario because everything is moving to the cloud. We had already discussed this, and everything is using mobile. And there is an aspect here that I want to bring to you is that I think a certain future is for us is to pay for our privacy. And this is kind of ironic because uh, when I was a musician, I paid for publicity. Right? I actually paid a lot of money for people to come and see me or, or you know, uh, actually find out about me. And now I'm going to pay people not to be found, the reverse. Right? But that's going to happen. I mean, I think we're all aware that as, as business people, we have to be found. People have to be able to look at us. Right? But who is allowed to use what data? Can people see my health record, you know, if they, if they know how to get in? So there, there is a, a key need here for safety trust, for United Nations of data. And, and the European Commission is talking about this every single day, of course. You know, how do we do this? And the Commissioner said, I think we have to have the right for privacy. We have to have the right to be left alone. That has to be part of the future also. So here's the opportunity for you. All business is becoming dynamic, real-time, social, mobile, local, fluid, and predictive. All business. And much like we can't sit here and say, you know, people are downloading my songs or my movies for free and they should pay, 
the answer is not for them to, that they, to tell them that they should pay, but to create a mechanism for them to get involved. And the same thing is here. If we don't like what people are doing with us and making life harder for us, it's not up to us to tell them that they should change their behavior. We're talking about five billion people here. And this is what they're going to do. If you're a CEO of a company, they're going to want to see your face and a video with you. And they want to see a product video and they want to see you on a LinkedIn page. They want to see all these things. So how can you say that it's not important? I don't, I don't follow. I mean, basically, these trends are huge paradigm shifts from the industrial age to the age of social, local, mobile, and very soon to the age of human-machine combinations, which I won't get into because we'll take another five hours. Another point here is that so far we've been very happily operating in silos. And I can, I can attest to you from first-hand experience, this is a huge problem. Because when you go to companies, you know, you've got the marketing guys, you've got the R&D guys, you've got the tech people, you've got the money people, everybody's in their own silos. And as companies, we're in our own silos. This is guaranteed future failure, because if you're a deep expert with money, that is highly valued now, but the future is going to be you are a deep expert, and then you can also go lateral. Right? You can combine things clearly is going to be a combination of those two, two things. Otherwise, I think we'll see system failure. Like, example, the music business here. Closed systems are becoming quickly isolated, disconnected, expensive, slow, irrelevant, and then die. And does anybody remember who EMI Records is? Right? The, one of the biggest music companies in the world. They're owned by some uh, you know, Siberian guy, I think. But I don't know where they're going to go with this, but basically, I mean, looking at this graph, it's, it's clear. When you run a closed system, when people want an open system, you're not going to be successful. I mean, Android, Google's operating system, is doing over 2 million installs a day because it's an entirely open system. It's beating Apple hands down on a worldwide level. So looking at this, basically, I think this is one of the things that we have to consider. We have to throw that switch towards open. And open, I don't mean naked. I don't mean free. I don't mean idiotic in the sense of, you know, everything is out in the open, you don't get paid. Right? With open, I mean an attitude, right? The question saying, going back to this report, right, this shift will be bad for the financial center. 65% of people in Luxembourg agree that this shift is bad, but the same ones are saying that this is a good political move. Right? So what is it? Are you going to be open or are you going to be closed? I mean, that, that's the question you have to ask. And there, there's no choice saying, you know, we'll be a little bit here, a little bit there. I and mean, basically, openness fuels growth. Bottom line, that's it. Look at the stats for Android. Look what happened with all the things. Look at the things that Google is doing with Google. Now that's all based on open data, open APIs, open platform standards, you know, stuff that we know from Linux days. Openness fuels growth. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't close at a certain point and, and harvest the fruit of that growth, you know, by being a little bit less open. Lots of companies do that. I call this open AMAP, open as much as possible. Okay. And if you look at what's happening with American Express, how they're giving away all the cherished financial information on their website, the open forum, for free, how GlaxoSmithKline is giving away 2 billion euros worth of cancer research for free, in the hope of finding somebody who will contribute to it, how Unilever is doing this. That's a clear strategy for the future. Open as much as possible, and then find a place where you can make it a little bit less open and monetize in some way. Hertz, a company I've used for the last 15 years, I haven't always been happy with Hertz. In fact, last month I decided I'm not going to rent from Hertz anymore. I won't go into that story, but then I read this, and I tried it, you know, using Twitter as a customer service platform. So Hertz has decided that they have to be open about all the stuff that has happened in the past, right? and they're using social media to show this. Right? They're using Twitter for customer support and publishing those complaints. And I decided to stick around and give them another try. Right? I mean, we're, we're basically now at the point to where we are immersing ourselves in, in data every single day, and this opportunity is gigantic to participate. We talked about brands earlier, and I, I have no idea, honestly, 
white Switzerland is the big, their number one country brand. You know, I, I keep sending this to my friends and saying it can't be true, must be a mistake. Uh, allegedly, you know, Denmark is the happiest country in the world. But when you talk to Danes, they're saying, no, this, this just can't be true. You know, but I, so I don't know, really know where that starts. <laughs> but Luxembourg isn't listed here. Switzerland tops the ranking of the 25 best country brands. I'm not saying that as a proud Swiss. I'm just quoting this because I also have a German passport. So, uh, Then Turkey, for example, I go to Turkey quite a bit for speaking, and people in Turkey tell me the country brand of Turkey is bad. For, for a lot of obvious reasons also, right? But, so what does it mean? I think countries as a brand has a huge relevance for Luxembourg. What do you stand for? When I was listening to the interview earlier about the most important things in Luxembourg for the future, right? Well, clearly, trust and professionalism, and those are kind of universal, right? and that, that's, that's good. I agree with that. But what is the positioning of Luxembourg? Is it going to be open, innovative, forward-looking, building an ecosystem? Is it going to be about those things that are more attributed uh, to technology? Is it going to be about this? I mean, everything a brand does that connects to the consumer is media. Everything that Luxembourg does is creating a brand. That's something to think about. I think it's a unique opportunity because the brand level of Luxembourg is high at this point. So there's a great opportunity to be partake. Trust. There's a great book you should read from my friend Roy Bagava called Lycanomics. And if you're not on Facebook or LinkedIn or so, you, maybe this is a little bit stretch for you. Lycanomics means that now it's becoming really important that other companies like other companies and people like companies. And basically this whole trust economy is proving again that trust is the only currency that there's left. People will do business with you because they trust you. doesn't matter if you charge more. They will definitely not do business with you if they don't trust you, even if it's free. Look at Huawei, China. So, reputation, capital, social, those are real currencies. I mean, we're talking, we're talking about uh, you know, Facebook uh, ideology here. I mean, this, this is uh, somebody who is a Starbucks fan on Facebook and has pushed the like button drinks twice as much coffee, spends twice as much money at Starbucks than anyone else. I mean, those things are facts that we have to face. But social capital is real. It's not some fancy innovation that came along with Twitter. Right? Oh, like economics. Right? So I'm, I need to come to the uh, summary here. I think otherwise we'll be uh, definitely short of our drinks here. But I, I think that um, for Luxembourg and for Switzerland, the Swiss ambassador is here, so I'm sharing that with him. We have to focus on disruptive opportunities. We cannot focus on creating band-aids, you know. We're losing an arm by putting a band-aid over it. Well, how, what is that going to do? We need to focus on making a new body, on disruptive opportunities. I mean, here's a few of them. Print on demand, 3D printing. This is the revolution that has been brought to the media business. It's coming to stuff now. Printing stuff, shoes, covers, in complex things, even houses can be printed with machines. The army is using this. Actual houses built with printing machines. 3D printing. The re-innovation of medicine, medical services. This is huge, because all of the technology that's happening there, including the tricorder, digital education. I mean, what better place for Luxembourg to take a lead in into making education go digital? Myriads of hurdles, you know, licensing problems, platform standards, and so on. But somebody's going to look at this business and say, you know what, if I can make one dollar for each person connecting on a tablet computer every other month, you know, that's five billion people connected in such a way. Huge opportunity. Broadcasting and media, the conversions of those two, huge opportunity. The Internet of Things, the human-machine overlap. I mean, scary topics and ethical questions, but definitely a huge opportunity that is being seized on a global level. Peer-to-peer -peer services. I mean, these business models are not some models that you can say, you know what, there's a bunch of nerds over in New York doing this. I mean, remember yesterday, Yahoo bought one of those nerds called Tumblr. 
right, with 250 million users for a mere $1.1 billion. Why do they do that? Because it's a peer-to-peer -peer platform. It's a platform where people do stuff together. This is going to be huge, it's not going to kill the other platforms. It's not. It's going to be in parallel. This intermediation, if it can go direct, it will. Airbnb, Uber, taxi service. If you want a, a black a, a, a town car, you don't want to go to the rental company, you can go to Uber in New York and a guy will pick you up who has such a car that you can book directly through the web like Airbnb for hotels. Amazon Studios, if it can go direct, it will. Other great opportunity, 68% of consumers around the world think that companies should do the right thing, parenthesis, whatever that means. But they, they, uh, most of them are also saying that the number one thing that they should be doing is to create sustainable products. So Patagonia, the jacket company, last year in America, launched a campaign, it was about two years ago. The campaign had a big fold out in a magazine and guess what it said on there? It said, don't buy this jacket. If you already have a jacket, do you really need another one? Can you fix it? Can you recycle it? Can you give it to somebody? And this campaign has resulted in last year an 18% sales increase. That's kind of paradox, right? But customers want to know that you care about everything that goes on. So sustainability is going to stop being one of those things that you think about when you, when you have time uh, on, the, on your ride to the airport. It becomes something that is part of the fabric of society. Right? And so what's really important, I think, for Luxembourg also here is to, to basically accept the fact that we live in a world of disruption, of abundance. Right? It's not going back to a calm scenario. We live in Marshall McLuhan Global Village, and we need a global brain. We have to think of global solutions, global offerings, I, have to, I mean, Luxembourg is very good at this, already bringing people to Luxembourg to, to work from here. Right? But this is basically where we're going with this. Right? Let me remind me of, uh, you of one of the key themes. Right? We're living in this world now. You don't want to be part of the moving wheels? Too bad. You don't get to have your own wheel. You don't get to be in a place to where you can just run the wheels. So let me give you a summary and some takeaway points, and then we'll have a discussion. First huge opportunity in creating a European ecosystem. Financial services, ICT, renewable energy, Internet of Things, many other things that I've touched on. Creating a, an ecosystem means actually creating something that works laterally. Big data. Who is the world going to trust to store the data of 5 billion people? And I don't mean cell phone data, I'm talking about all the data. Most intimate data. Because that's what's going to happen. Is it going to trust Google for that? Wait and see is deadly. We have to become market makers. There is no such thing as wait and see. We can pretend that there is, but basically it means wait and die. Abundance. This idea of a zero-sum story, like, you know, I, I get everything, you get nothing, or the reverse, is over. There is enough. We can make a bit of pie. There's abundance of ideas, abundance of technology, abundance of innovation, abundance of money. So the other thing is that, you know, because of this fact that in 2018, most of your revenues will come from things that you haven't even thought about today, that means innovation is your only chance. It's not something that you can discuss, you know, between product launches. Google guys get 20% of their time to work on alpha projects, new projects, and $50,000 discretionary budget to make them. They have 1,250 or something like that alpha projects that have nothing to do with the current business. So turbocharged innovation is crucial. It's not something that we can debate on. Hyper-collaboration not hyper-competition. The U.S. Post Office last year signed a deal with UPS, which is the biggest enemy of any post office in the world, but especially in America, to collaborate on delivering local parcels. Because it was clear if they do that, they can gain together rather than 
die individually. The Internet of Things, ICT, Internet of Things, machine to machine communications, artificial intelligence. I mean, that, that's obvious. I'm telling you the obvious, but the opportunities there are mind boggling. And they also have to do with trust. Nobody's going to trust people creating artificial intelligence to replace people and openness. And this is the reason why you should care about social media, because it's not about Facebook or any of those fig leaf things. Right? It's basically about saying that we care to connect to others, to talk about what's going on, to, to look forward. Openness fuels growth. So I want to thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope I didn't uh, kill all of your future hopes. I hope I actually got to kindle some of them. Uh, not with the machine, but with fire. Um, and so I have a website called gurdcloud.com, which is a Dropbox folder. You can download all of my stuff on gurdcloud, my books, my presentations, and the slideshow sometime later tonight. And uh, now I